Okay, so uh, let's continue from wherever we left off. Uh, uh, we essentially were looking into the characteristics, the incremental characteristics of a two port network. And we figured that we figured that in order for us to get a power amplification, that is, if I have a source here connected to across this port, and I have a load here connected between these two ports, not only this uh, this network needs to be nonlinear, certain characteristics needs to be uh, satisfied, and the characteristics that were needed to be satisfied were the in incremental input impedance that is one over y11 needed to be infinity or y11 had it needed to be zero right so so the wish list that we had wish list was y11 had to be zero so this is equivalent to saying incremental input resistance is equal to infinity. So this is y11. But this another way of saying this is del i1 del b1 is zero. Similarly, we can say we wanted y22 to be also zero, which means incremental output resistance needed to be infinity or del i2, del v2 needed to be zero. And then we said that, I mean, we argued on this for some time that del i1, del v2 also needed to be zero to prevent uh, inadvertent reverse transmission which could have resulted in oscillation this this meant that y12 was zero however the last thing that is y21 which was del v del i2 del v del i2 del v1 we wanted this to be tending towards infinity because this is my forward transmission parameter. Then we uh, we were, I mean, these are in the incremental sense. Then we said that, uh, we need to figure out what this means in terms of the total IV characteristics because the stuff within the box, when you characterize it, you are more interested in their total IV characteristic and not only the incremental one. Incremental characteristics is only a, uh, is only derivatives of the total IV characteristics, right? So, uh, Then we said that the physical, okay, so physical reason we can look at it from the incremental, I mean, if I model this in the incremental sense, right? So this pair, the stuff within the box in the incremental sense was essentially a linear two port network. So a linear two port network, we could have expressed this in this form, right? This is V1. I1, this is Y11. In terms of resistance, this is one over Y11. Then I had a control current source, which is Y12, V2, where V2 is at the other port. And this is one by Y22. 
and this current source we also modeled it as y21 v1 right and then we said that these are my inputs and this is my output connected between the two terminals so what i wanted was the fact that on the output side i wanted all the controlled current all of this controlled current all of this output current which is dependent on the input side to go into this load right so we didn't want any current splitting between its internal resistance right it's one over y22 is that internal resistance, internal incremental resistance so we wanted one over y22 to go to infinity or in other words y22 to go to zero and similarly you note that i mean uh, the current at the input side right the volt or rather the voltage at the input side the v1 is is a uh, is a division is, is a result of voltage division between between the source resistance and this incremental input resistance one over y11 so we wanted the entire voltage the input voltage to appear across the input controlling port so so wish list for our y11 was it had to be zero because if i look into here and i find that the input impedance is infinity then obviously v1 becomes equal to we are okay and uh, this obvious i mean all these things is happening under the condition that y12 is zero right otherwise you'll have to go back and redo what is the input impedance and all those things so uh, so there is no reverse transmission this y12 v2 is equal to zero so if that that is satisfied the next condition that we would want is the looking in impedance r in to be equal to zero and why do we want that we want that because note that the output current right so the output current <laughs> that is flowing into this flowing into or out of this resistor is proportional to the input control port voltage v1 so higher the v1 more the output current which means more the output uh, final output voltage since we, since we are looking for amplifying as much as we as we can we don't we want maximum v1 as well since we want maximum v1 we would want i mean what is the maximum that i can get in a resistor divider it can be whatever we are applied and that is under the condition that input impedance is equal to uh, input resistance is equal to infinity right so this is essentially our wish list any questions on any of these things that we discussed yesterday no okay good uh, so uh, one more uh, caveat that i would like to address uh, we talked at length yesterday um, and argued that y12 should be equal to zero in order to prevent oscillation which indeed is true but you must have done feedback circuits in esc201 where you have op amp you have put things in negative feedback right so one might argue that in those cases why are those i mean if if reverse transmission is bad then why are we at all putting things in negative feedback and it seems that they are working also in esc201 labs you have seen things work so uh, so the argument towards that is if you are in charge of the feedback right you can control the feedback accurately then you can set the parameter <laughs> values those r r1 r2 those values to, uh, in such a way that to prevent that denominator to go to zero but if you are if you if you are not in control right if it yeah, if the device parameters or the network parameters are setting those that feedback then it's likely that under some conditions maybe temperature changed maybe something else changed the condition of the device that you are operating change it can self start, start to self oscillate so you, in most cases you would want negative feedback you will see later on why you would want negative feedback but you if you are using negative feedback to get certain desired output you would like to be in control of what is happening right you don't want something else which is not in your control to set the feedback so this y12 y21 these are internal parameters to the device which to some extent are i mean in a, they, you can control them in a very crude sense but not in a very accurate manner the, the way you can control let's say a value of a resistor or a value of a capacitance and so on so that is why if there if you at all want a negative feedback you would want to put something intentionally not that the structure of the stuff inside is giving you some negative feedback these things will become clear later on if 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 i mean if it's slightly vague don't bother right now 
Okay, fine. So, uh, so, so this led us to the this led us to the conclusions that uh, if I have, we wanted to figure out the large signal characteristics also because that's what this stuff in the box essentially is telling us. If this is V one, this is I one, E two, I two. Okay. Okay. So y one one to be equal to zero. So y one one to be equal to zero implied that the i one v one characteristics was a horizontal line, right? It was a straight line. Similarly, i two y two two equal to zero implied this to be also to be equal to of a straight line. Same here. However, y two one tending to infinity implies that the slope, I think I messed up something somewhere. This was supposed to be y21, right? y21 is del i2 del v1 and y12 is del uh, So y21 is del i2 del v1. So this slope had to be as large as you want, as you can rather. We want infinity, right? So, uh, so then I asked you what type of, I mean, so by the way, all these things, I mean, when you are looking at each of these plots, for example, when I'm looking at the, this plot, I am assuming that this has been uh, plotted under the condition that V2 is constant, right? So this is for a certain V2 cube. So this is for V2 equal to, let's say V2 cube. If I change V2, V2 is essentially a parameter for that plot. If I change V2, this can as well be another, another horizontal straight line, right? Similarly for all the other cases, right? For, for, for uh, I2, V2, for Y2, 2 equal to zero, I'm assuming V1 equal to V1 cube, right? So similarly for this plot also, I am assuming V2 equal to V2 Q and this V1 equal to V1 Q. So this is all under the hood assumptions, okay? So then I was uh, uh, trying to convince you uh, that what, what does this plot signify? Then one of you uh, said that this signifies like a current source. Then I said, yeah, probably, I mean, uh, we can look at it in some different manner, but having, I mean, uh, one can argue that at least in in this range that I have plotted, right? In this range that I have plotted, it looks like a current source. I mean, you can as well argue that this looks like a current source, right? So that is a that is actually a fair fair enough argument. Now, whether it looks like a current source all across the ranges of V one, that's a different question. But it looks like a current source. So fine, so if, I mean, it looks like a current source that is okay, but we are more interested in figuring out what property of the current source am I more interested in? So note that we are trying to, I mean, how did we come up with this? We are more, we came up with this because we wanted Rn to be equal to infinity, right? The input impedance needed to be infinity, which means input conductance had to be zero. The incremental input conductance needed to be zero. That's why I1, V1 was a flat line. Okay. So now, as it turns out, as it turns out, we have devices. We have devices like uh, MOSFETs. I mean, preceding MOSFETs, we had cathode ray tubes, vacuum tubes, and so on. Then you had BJTs. Then nowadays, you have FinFETs and some other devices like gate all around MOSFETs and so on. All of these devices have one thing in common. Is that the common thing is that they follow these type of characteristics, these four characteristics that I have drawn for certain ranges of V1 and V2, okay? So if I take for example of a MOSFET, if I take the example of a MOSFET, I, do you know how, how a MOSFET looks like? 
you know, okay, fine. So I, I'll go through that. Uh, so if I, I mean, the, let's start off with a with the symbol of a morphic. So here, a MOSFET is essentially, for all intents and purposes, it's a three-terminal device where one, you can say that this is your controlling terminal V1, input terminal, and these are the output terminals V2, where one terminal is shared. It's a three-terminal device where one terminal is shared and the other, the two ports are, are, are the two ports are essentially for uh, these ports one, two, three. So between one and two, you have port one, and between three and two, you have port two, right? So this essentially is a MOSFET, the structure, I mean, the, the symbol of a MOSFET. And as it turns out, the input impedance, I mean, if you look into the terminal one, right, if you look into terminal one, it appears to be open circuit. Okay, so if it appears to be open circuited, then then in case of a MOSFET, this I1, V1 characteristic is actually zero, dotted, actually zero, not even a constant uh, current, okay? But I mean, since we don't know what a MOSFET structure looks like, so what I'll do is I will go through some of the uh, basic device related stuffs, which will help you appreciate why a MOSFET characteristics or how a MOSFET, I mean, how, how does a MOSFET look like and why does this IV characteristic satisfy these four conditions? Okay, so that essentially will be on the next uh, part of uh, this lecture and maybe some part of the next lecture. Okay, so the input current is actually zero. Okay, so we'll see why. Uh, so before embarking into this journey of MOSFET, I want some information from you that what is your understanding of uh, basic semiconductor physics. Do you understand the concepts of um, holes and electrons? Yes, sir. Right? Okay, good. So that's a good starting point. So, so let's understand, let's start off from there. So you have a piece of silicon, let's say. Let's say I have a piece of silicon. <laughs> Assume this is a crystalline silicon. Okay, it's a crystalline silicon and in a crystalline silicon, you have these silicon atoms and they are covalently bonded with their neighbors. So, and assume that this is at operating at zero Kelvin. Okay, we are at zero Kelvin. So now can you tell me how many free electrons will be there in this crystalline structure? Zero, right? Because all the covalent bonds are satisfied, right? There is no free energy in the system. So no bonds can be broken. So you'll have zero free electrons, right? So now let's say we have increased the temperature and we have come to room temperature, 300 Kelvin. So what is likely to happen? So these bonds, some of these bonds can break, right? Some, if let's assume one bond break broke. So if a bond breaks, what is happening? And an electron can, <laughs> I can assume that an electron became free of its bond, right? So now it's free to move around. Now, what is a hole? Ah, okay, there is a space that was left by the electron. So I can, for all intents and purposes, I can say that this locally, this stuff became positively charged, right? So now locally that became positively charged, but on an average, this crystal is charge neutral, right? On an average, it is charge neutral. Now, this is a thermodynamic process, which means you have to get into statistical mechanics and so on. So what you have to, obviously we cannot go there in this course. So uh, what you have to assume at the back of your, of your mind is that these 
types of recombination, this type of generation of electron and hole pairs are happening throughout the crystal. Okay. Now note that we are talking about equilibrium here. We are talking about thermal equilibrium, which means that for what is the thermal equilibrium? For every process, there is an equal and opposite inverse process that is happening. That is why that is when we can get an equilibrium. If one process runs away, we get constant regeneration or constant recombination or whatever, right? So, which means in this case, there is a since we are having electron hole pairs generation at certain rate, and we are by definition talking about thermal equilibrium, which means at the back of your mind, you also need to understand that somewhere the process of recombination is also happening. For every statistically, for every uh, for statistically for generation of every electron hole pair. There is a recombination of electron hole pair that is also also happening. Okay, so now, uh, well, now what we are what we are essentially saying is, if we put a battery, right? If we put a battery across this piece of silicon, what what are we uh, what what is likely to happen? So naturally, <clears throat> the electric field that will develop across this silicon will be in this direction which means that this electron will try to move to the left. And one might argue that the hole tries to move to the right, right? So now this concept can be a bit tricky to start off. That's why I'm asking, do you understand why this happens? Okay, fine. So why does this happen? Pardon? Okay, but how can a hole move? Hole is a vacancy. Ah, okay, great. So hole does not move. What essentially happens is a bond breaks nearby, and a bond and 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 the bond essentially shifts, right? The the nearby a nearby bond shifts to where the hole was. So essentially, a bond breaks, and a new bond forms. Right? So now you require some energy to break a bond, but you require the exact amount of energy to form that new bond. So essentially nothing has changed thermodynamically. Just that uh, the location of the hole has shifted. Okay, since the, uh, since the location of the hole has shifted, I can, uh, I can uh, and note that these processes are happening throughout the crystal, which means that for every cross section that I am looking at, there is, the number of electrons that is crosses this cross section will be equal to the number of holes that is crossing uh, i mean that is passing this cross section on the opposite direction which essentially means that in terms of charge i am seeing double the amount of charge than the number of electrons that is crossing a cross section which means that i will have to take into account the fact that there is other than electrons there is something else that is also that is also causing movement of charge across any surface that is why we take into account in semiconductors, we take into account holes and electrons both while considering carrier transport. Okay, good. So now another question that, uh, that directly comes to mind is that when I have an electric field and I put a charge, yes. Okay, so the plane aspect is the following. So, I showed you one electron hole pair at, I, mean, I showed you the generation of a one electron hole pair at certain location in the crystal. But that is happening throughout the crystal, right? So now let's assume that another bond broke somewhat, somewhere here, okay? So now consider this, consider this electron, this electron was moving towards the left, right? Now, because another bond broke somewhere over here, this hole will move to the right. Now, whole bunches of electrons are moving to the left. And now consider that surface that I have drawn. So, so that the charge that is moving uh, through the surface, effective charge that is moving to the right is a summation of holes and electrons, but they are moving in the opposite directions. So essentially I'm getting double the movement of charges. That's why you have to consider, I mean, in a perfect metal, you don't consider holes because metal is ionic, right? So here is covalent. Because it's covalent, whenever you have whenever you deal with covalent crystalline structures, 
you have to take into account movement of both poles and electrons right so this is the i mean i mean this is the classical way of explaining stuff but i'm sure you'll be taking 311 there you will see how these are models these are all quantum mechanical models uh, we are trying to uh, use some sort of heuristics or abstractions to to understand what is uh, what is going on okay so now the next question is now clearly this movement is happening because there is electric field and we have free charges right so when you put a free charge in electric field you the charge experiences force and one can argue that because of that force it should accelerate right so do you think uh if the charge keeps on accelerating through this crystal i should see an increase in the movement of increase in current as time passes by right it doesn't happen so why doesn't it happen because of collision right so essentially what happens is this is similar to the concept of terminal velocity when you drop something from maybe out of space because of gravity it doesn't always keep on accelerating it reaches a terminal velocity because of viscosity so here the similar thing is you have this is you, you are not dealing with a single electron in vacuum single hole in vacuum you have whole bunch of other stuff it's like in a traffic right you might have a ferrari that can go at a million miles an hour but you are stuck in kanpur traffic you can only go at the pace of the traffic so it's a, it, it, it's something like that right so so when you are in an ensemble when your i mean this is like a, a hard thinking also you can say right so you behave like your environment so if if is a if a electron or a hole is stuck in its environment it has to cater to the uh, what the environment is bringing in right so in other words if i if i invoke the analogy of terminal velocity uh, you can assume that these these un, un, when you when you apply an electric field the velocity of the of a representative electron on an average electron is some constant times electric field okay this d subscript d actually i should write it as v drift because I, again in semiconductors you will see there are two types of motions that happen one is drift other is diffusion we will not get into diffusion here uh, but since this motion is happening because of a uh, voltage difference between the terminals or rather we due to an applied electric field this type of motion is called drift uh, drift motion and the velocity that you that uh, that uh, occurs because of this of this motion is called drift velocity and this constant is called mobility and and it should not be of any surprise to note that is mobility is is it depends on the type of device that you are dealing with so similarly i mean just like the example of dropping a ball from outer space depending depends on what is the dimension of the ball what is the thickness of the air your your uh, uh, the terminal velocity changes similarly here depends on what type of structure you are dealing with the mobility changes okay so silicon has certain mobility germanium has certain mobility and each type of semiconductor has certain mobility but it's a property of of the uh, of the semiconductor oh okay, good so now let's let's uh, uh, let's move our attention to the fact that we normally do not use pure crystalline silicon to do many things what we generally do is we dope we dope the silicon with some impurities do you understand doping okay so what is doping <laughs> can you repeat <laughs> correct so any type of impurity is a certain type of impurity okay so one type of i mean there are certain types you are absolutely right so certain types of impurities mean that let's say assume i mean silicon is 2s i mean 2s to 2p2 yeah okay so four electrons in his valence band so a 3s to 3p2 i think right yeah okay so regardless so i mean obviously i'm not in a chemistry class so uh, so i can get by right so uh, so if i if if i dope it with let's say uh, arsenic right which has five electrons in its outer shell so what generally tends to happen is that again statistically 
I mean, it can replace one of these silicon atoms and sit here. <laughs> so now when it replaces the silicon atom and sits here, it has four bonds it can satisfy with the neighboring silicon atom, but it has one dangling bond. And which essentially means that that dangling bond under thermodynamic condition can break, right? So which when it breaks, we have an electron that has come up because of arsenic that you have doped in, which is free to move under the influence of electric field. Okay. So now if you dope this sufficiently, then it, as it turns out, you can, you can, okay. So now one might argue that what happens, I mean, I have a, I have an arsenic which lost an electron, which means I have a positive charge ion that is sitting, right? If the electron leaves its parent orbitals, you have a positively charged arsenic ion sitting there. So is that a hole? It's not a hole, why? Because no empty orbital is for other electrons to come in the Correct, right? So no equivalent bond can be formed, right? So the one way to think about it is that, so note that in, when, when, when the, in the earlier case, when a silicon bond broke and another silicon bond and the recombination, generation recombination and the silicon re reached thermal equilibrium, uh, what was essentially happening was whenever a bond breaks, statistically, there is another bond that is getting formed, right? So there is no energy that is, so the energy required to form a bond is arguably equal to the energy required to break that bond. So that's why I am getting a thermodynamic equilibrium. As it turns out, in case of, uh, if a silica, even arsenic atom, uh, atom sits, sits there, then the energy required to break that arsenic bond, right? The extra ion, extra electron that came out of arsenic is much smaller than the energy that would have required for a neighboring uh, silicon atom to break its own bond and give the electron to arsenic. So in this case, the like probability of an arsenic bond breaking is higher than the probability of a silicon bond breaking and filling up that hole, right? So that is why whenever an impurity like a silicon is loses an electron, the hole that is created, the positive charge that is created cannot move statistically because its likelihood of getting filled up is lesser than a likelihood of a, I mean, the case of a pure silicon uh, example that we gave. So that is why these plus charges are fixed charges, right? And the electron that it gives out is free to move. Now, one can always uh, say that, hey, I mean, now I know that, I mean, there's a thing called hole, there is a thing called electron. So I can do the same thing with uh, and another impurity, which is, which has three electrons in its outer orbital, right? So something like a boron, if I dope it with a boron, then maybe a boron sits here, like it doesn't have an extra bond. Right, so a hole from a neighboring silicon atom comes in and fills. Sorry, an electron from a neighboring silicon atom comes and fills its vacancy. So which generates a hole, which is free to move, but this boron becomes negatively charged and sits there. Now this fixed charge, the the the. Char the uh, the negative charge due to boron and the positive charge due to arsenic are cannot move, but the, the, the holes that holes and electrons that boron and arsenic gave are free to move. Okay. So, so that's why when we have when we dope something with arsenic or any anything which has gives which has five or uh, five electrons in its outer shell, we uh, we we are essentially dumping more and more free electrons. Right? Note that again, even if I dump a lot of arsenic, the entire stuff is charge neutral. Right? The entire crystal is still charge neutral. But then what has changed? The free electrons have changed. Number of free electrons has changed with respect to a pure crystalline silica. Okay. So if I dope, if I dope it with arsenic, if I dope it with arsenic, then I'll have a lot more free electrons than holes. If I dope it with boron, 
depending upon the doping concentration, I am likely to have a lot more free holes than electrons. Yes. Oh no, you just dump. It. So it's uh, so initially what is uh, uh, so uh, in it, so what actually happens is you take a silicon crystal, right, and then you liquefy it, right. So you don't start with the crystal. You liquefy the some, it's amorphous silicon. You liquefy it. Then you also put in the impurities that you want. And then you cool it in certain manner. So you, you, you end up with uh, a crystal which is of which is of certain inclination. It might be N or it might be P, right? But that is not the only type of creatine. So you can actually you, you can actually have a piece of silicon which is doped in any manner, but you can essentially spray impurities on top of it. And because, because uh, these uh, silicon atoms, uh, I mean, obviously you can assume that a crystal has a lot of empty space, right, inside. So, so now uh, when you spray impurities on top of it due to very, I mean, diffusion activity, right, because what is diffusion? You have certain concentration of some element at one end, lesser concentration at other end. So if there is a path of this element from going from this side to that side, it can diffuse because of gradient. So because of diffusion activities, these impurities move and, 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 uh, and, uh, and fill up the spaces, right? So these are uh, things that you will learn in 3.11, okay? So, so the moot point is that, the moot point is that now you can get, you can get a piece of silicon, which, which, uh, which can be rich in electrons, rich in mobile electrons, or you can get a piece of silicon, which is rich in mobile holes. So now the rich in mobile electrons, we call it as n-type silicon, and the rich, the stuff that is called, we call it rich in mobile holes is called a p-type silicon. So let's assume that I have a p-type, n-type silicon here. This is type silicon. And let's assume I have a p-type silicon here. And I brought them together. So I, I created a junction. I created a junction here. They're physically connected to each other. Yes. Yeah, they are overall charge neutral. But P type and N type signifies the predominant mobile carriers are electrons or holes. When I say more electrons, I mean free electrons. Because how did it become free? It had an arsenic atom, which, uh, which lost an electron, but the arsenic hole, the, the, the charge created due to the so so, it, so we have more electrons, free electrons, yes. Right. So it creates, so it got wet. It, it captured an electron from somewhere, right? From where did it capture? It captured an electron from a neighboring silicon bond. Oh, no, this has nothing to do with electric field. This is this is under thermal equilibrium. No electric field applied, right? So under thermal equilibrium, the likelihood of an arsenic losing its bond. Is quite high. I mean, quite. These are all very heuristic statements. But I assume that an arsenic atom can do this electron easily. So now, or rather, in this case, a boron atom can attract one of the neighboring can can shake hands with one of the neighboring silicon easily. So now the neighboring silicon lost an electron, right? So it created this hole. Now a silicon hole is mobile, so it can move around. But the but the bond that the boron form cannot move around, the equivalent to the arsenic example. Right? So because of doping, the the counter charge, right? Other than the, I mean, when you are doping with arsenic, it the the, the free charge that is by the definition the free charge is free to move, but the alternate plus plus charge 
that got generated there are none. So that's why when you do with infinity, we, 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 we don't generate double the amount of carriers. Right? Normally, in, 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 when you have P and N in, in an intrinsic silicon, for every bond that breaks, you can generate double the carriers. Holes move one side, electron moves to another side. In this case, although we are generating double the number of plus and minus charges, the plus cannot move, but minus can move. Right? So, it, and the opposite happens in case of a driver and impurity, as you pointed out. Okay. Okay, fine. So, so now let's let's put this P and N stuff together. When I'm putting this P and N stuff together, what is happening? So note that here I have on the P side, I have lot many holes. Sorry, I should not. On the N side, I have lot many electrons. <laughs> but underneath, underneath, I know that on the N side, I have lot many fixed plus charges. And on the whole side, I have lot many fixed minus charges, right? So now when I'm putting this together, it, and since now the, this barrier is permeable, so the, the mobile charges can permeate from one side to another because it simply sees that, I mean, less of concentration on one side, it can diffuse. It can diffuse from one, in, one side to another. So essentially what can happen is these holes, these holes can, some of these holes can move this side and some of these electrons can move the other side. So now what happens is when you, when the holes move and when they change positions, right? When they change positions, so, so you can assume that one way to think of it is that they, they neutralize themselves, right? And hole and electrons, they change positions and they neutralize themselves. And when it happens, you, when it happens, what you end up with is, so these fixed charges, since they cannot move, the fixed charges cannot move. So there will be an area or there will be a region around that junction where you have only fixed charges, but no mobile charges. Okay. And one might argue that why, why this is, I mean, one might argue that if, if let's assume I have equal number, the concentration of holes on the P type and the concentration of electrons on the N type are identical, why don't all of them neutralize each other? Ah, okay, so the reason it doesn't happen is, so for each combination that takes place, right? I am exposing one plus, immobile charge on one side and one minus immobile charge on the other side. And which essentially means that I am in, inherently building up, I'm incurring a electric field, which connects the positive, positive immobile charge on one end to the negative <laughs> immobile charge on the other end. And statistically, when this keeps on happening, and under thermal equilibrium, you will generate an electric field around the interface. And when this happens, the electrons on the left side, as I have drawn, is now finding an electric, I mean, it's finding a hindrance to go to the right because now it has an electric field which is, which is preventing it to go to the right. And the holes on the right are finding a hindrance to go to the left because again, electric field opposes its movement. So under thermal equilibrium, this diffusion of charges keep on happening till the time the amount, certain amount of electric field or the optimum amount or the perfect amount of electric field has been generated when they cannot move anymore, okay? And so this, when you have an electric field across some distance, you have a potential. And you get a potential, you get a potential, and this potential we call it built-in potential of a PN junction. And this PN junction is essentially what you see as a diode, right? So this is a PN junction diode. And how does a diode actually work when you have Let's assume you, uh, you put a battery and you put a battery in this, this, in the, in the direction that I have shown, which essentially means that the job of this battery is to oppose this built-in potential, right? 
the job of this battery is to oppose the building potential. So as it turns out, okay, now when it, intuitively it should be evident that I am, when I'm reducing the building potential, I'm adding more and more diffusion. From, I am adding more and more carrier flow from one side to another, right? So what was preventing the carrier flow? What was preventing all the electrons and holes to get recombined? It was this built-in potential, the electric field that got generated, which was not allowing more electrons than what was permitted by thermal equilibrium to diffuse. Now, if I can somehow reduce the electric field, then more electrons can go, more holes can go. And that essentially is the current flow in a forward bias diode, right? And as it turns out, again, it can, I mean, this again comes from uh, Fermi direct distribution that the rate at which the diffusion is dependent on this BBI is exponential. So the current, or rather in this case, J, that is current density is proportional to E to the power delta VBI by KT. Okay, so obviously I cannot prove it here, but you have to take my word for it. So, so because of this definite, because of this dependence, you get an exponential current with respect to the applied voltage across the across the diode in a forward bias condition. Now, when you have a forward bias, and obviously, obviously there is implication that there is a reverse bias. So, what happens under a reverse bias condition? Let me write here. It's getting messy, but it's okay. Uh, so let's assume that I have a reverse bias condition. So when I have a reverse bias condition, what am I doing? I am helping that built-in potential grow bigger and bigger, right? So I'm helping this built-in potential to grow bigger and bigger, which means I'm preventing the current flow even, even more, right? So that's why in a reverse bias diode, you don't get much current, right? But you get still some current, you get some IS, right? You still get some current and that happens because that happens because regardless of whatever the condition your device is in, there is always recombination, thermal, thermally generated recombination and uh, thermal generation and recombination that keeps on happening, right? So that is a thermal process. It doesn't matter you have applied a field, whether you have, uh, 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 whether you have N-type, P-type, it doesn't really matter. There is always electron hole generation that is taking place in a piece of semiconductor. So similarly, I mean, just because I have said that this, this region, which we call depletion region, because it's supposed to be depleted of mobile charges, that doesn't mean that you don't have any electron hole pairs that, that are getting generated there. There is always electron hole, there are always bonds bro being broken and new bonds being formed, which means there are always E and H getting generated everywhere in, in this piece of silicon including the part which is depleted. Now, if you, if, you get a, if you get E and H generated, which side do you think, let's say, the electron will flow? Because note that I have a built-in potential. I, the electron hole pairs are generated in the depletion region where I have a built-in potential. So which side will electron flow? To the right. And the holes will flow to the left. So essentially, I will have a current, I'll have a current which will flow from right to left. So this is the reverse saturation current, IS, that you see in your diagram. Okay, and this is, this is a function of the rate of thermally generated, thermal generation. And that is why when you increase temperature, this IS increases. Because when you increase temperature, you have more and more carriers which can, which, which can form, which can move around because of a thermal effects, okay? Okay, fine. So we'll stop here. Uh, there will be no class this week. We'll meet on Monday.